to see everybody here this morning and pray for the Lord's blessing as we meet together to worship Christ. Let's take our chorus books and turn to page 10 in the chorus book, page number 10. Sing this, the Christ of the Cross, not just the old blood thing, but the Christ of the Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify. So I cherish the Christ of the cross Till his trophies at last he brings home I will cling to the Christ of the cross And I'll praise him in glory that day Speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. 
Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of the truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and thy scepter is the kingdom of thy kingdom is a righteous scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia. Out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters were among the honorable women upon the right hand, and did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear, forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the kings greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift, even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful that your name is known through all the universe and all your creation. Lord, we're thankful for the work of your Son at the cross to save us from our sin. We're thankful for these scriptures that testify and prophesy of his coming and that his fulfillment was fulfilled. Lord, we ask that you bless the teaching of your word today that you will open our hearts and our ears and give us understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our bulletins, and on the inside cover, we'll sing this hymn to the tune of Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, Precious Jesus, Friend of Sinners. Precious Jesus, Friend of Sinners, we as such to Thee draw near. Let thy spirit now dwell in us and with love our souls inspire. Fill, O oh, fill us, fill, O oh, fill us with that love which casts out fear, with that love that casts out fear. Matchless Savior, let us view Thee as the Lord our righteousness. Cause each soul to cleave unto Thee, come and with Thy presence bless. Dear Emmanuel, dear Emmanuel, Feast us with thy sovereign grace. Feast us with thy sovereign grace. Open now thy precious treasure. Let the blessings freely flow. Give to each a gracious measure of thy glory here below loving bridegroom loving bridegroom tis thyself we want to know tis thyself we want to know come and claim us as thy portion and let us lay claim to thee. Leave us not to empty notion, but from bondage set us free. King of glory, King of glory, we would live and reign with thee. We would live and reign with thee.
That's a great hymn as well. I'm thankful to be able to sing it with some understanding. Robert is going to come and read for us. Good morning. Second Peter chapter 1, the reading of the Lord's Word. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you now and we praise you. Lord, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Lord, we, we thank you for giving us that mercy and grace that we may believe in Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you to be with Brother Ken today as he's delivered us the word and open our hearts to receive it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Coming back to that portion a little later in the message, exceeding great and precious promises. What a great theme. Well, let's take our hymn book, hymn number 47, All Glory to Jesus. All glory to Jesus, begotten of God, the great I am is he, creator, sustainer, but wonder of all, the Lamb of Calvary. To think that the guardian of planets in space, the shepherd of the stars, is tenderly leading the church of his love, 
by hands with crimson scars. The King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, He reigns in glory now. Someday He is coming, earth's kingdom to claim, and every knee shall bow, and every knee shall bow. You talk about the gospel packed into three verses. That's a great hymn. I love it. David is going to come and read for us. John chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said unto you, un not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Boy, you think, we thank you that we can gather to read your word and hear Christ proclaimed. The world hates this word because it hates Christ. For without Christ's blood, we would all be doomed to open our eyes to see. Amen. Well, we're continuing our study here in this portion of Scripture where Christ was teaching his disciples, preparing them for going to the cross and ultimately in his ascension after his resurrection into glory. So a time where the Lord clearly had told him there's going to be trouble this is the part where he said if a man doesn't take up his cross and follow me he cannot be my disciple this is not some popular Jesus that's out there for anybody that really wants to follow him he's looking for followers no he came to save a particular people that the father gave him and for them he would go to the cross but as we've been seeing the disciple is not above his master. If they hated Christ, they'll hate you. And you can imagine, because he's left now the upper room. He's left the place where Judas went out to betray him. All of this is in motion now. The Lord directing it all. And yet, here he is teaching such profound teaching. Look how long it's taking us to go through this and study it. I can imagine him walking along with his disciples and saying these things and I would be one like I need something to write this down but this is the beauty of how the Lord purposed that they would be taught because he already told them that he would send his spirit and they would the spirit would bring to remembrance all things concerning him that's the glory here of what we're reading right now John wasn't walking along with some kind of clay tablet dictating as the Lord talked, writing down. No. All of this the Lord brought back to his memory. But what a glorious portion to be able to read and understand this from one who was there. This is not just some made-up fable. This is one who saw Christ and even speaks about that in his first epistle, whose hands calls him the word of life have touched this is the one who laid his head on our savior's breast and now he's bringing to remembrance for us as we read this of these things that the lord taught him so that's why i've entitled this message precious promises because that's really what it is in chapter 15 that we just finished our lord was preparing his disciples for persecution this is not some easy believism, and it's no different today. I will tell you, if the Lord ever reveals in you 
this Christ of Scripture, you're going to face opposition. It might not be unto death, but you're going to face opposition from family members, from acquaintances and associates who are religious people, just like they were in Christ's day. And yet they suffered separation, but that's what the Lord purposed. So that's what our Lord's doing in chapter 15 and part of chapter 16, because look how it begins in verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Some, it takes a while to figure out that your place is not in these religious synagogues, maybe where you grew up. And now when the Lord has taught you of Christ and him crucified, all of a sudden people are against you. They'll put you out. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Maybe they don't literally kill you, but if you could see their thoughts, thoughts kill. They'd love to see you dead and gone. I remember that congregation years ago up in Grand Rapids when the elders all gathered as they were kicking me out and I was leaving, not knowing what the next step was. But I remember one of those saying to me, I wouldn't be surprised, Ken, to see your name in the obituary within two weeks. That's just how much they hated not just me, but the very Christ that I was endeavoring to preach to them at that time. That separation is difficult, and it's tough when you have a family. But I look back now, and I thank God for bringing out that separation. Else I probably would never have left. I would have thought, well, I can stay here and still try to do the Lord's work. Nope, you can't build on a false foundation. And so this is what our Lord is preparing now his disciples here in chapter 16. He pre prepares them in verse chapter 15 for persecution, in chapter 16 for perseverance. How is it that these now are going to persevere in the face of this opposition? Well, he does it with what? Many precious promises. I see a tenderness here in our Lord, even as he warns them of what's ahead, yet at the same time, reminding them he's not going to leave them alone and does not. And I'm thankful that that's the case. What was true of them is true for any of us that are members of his spiritual body today, the church. We're not left orphans. Stop and think about it a minute. Here we gather some 2,000 years later meeting here. Is Christ present with us or isn't he? I hope he is. I pray he is. He says he is, where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in their midst. But we're not looking for any kind of physical appearances of Christ, but he's present in his spirit and in his word. What we're reading here is a love letter to those that he came and shed his blood to save. And that's why I referred earlier to 2 Peter chapter 1 that we just read for our scripture reading. If you'll go back over there, 2 Peter chapter 1, this is what Peter was speaking of. Peter was facing persecution, opposition. In fact, when you read the annals of history, you'll learn that Peter was crucified. That's how he died. But he so honored the Lord that when they wanted to crucify him, he asked to be crucified upside down. He said he was not worthy that he should even be crucified as his Lord was crucified. That's an amazing testimony. You say, Peter, isn't he the one that denied the Lord around the fire there? Yep. Isn't he the one, though, that the Lord, when he came out of that judgment hall, looked at him, didn't have to say anything? And it says Peter wept. The Lord never left him alone. Really, the only difference between Peter and Judas, they both denied the Lord, is that Peter had a redeemer. Peter had a ransom. And the Lord said to him, I've prayed for you, Peter. And when you're, when you're converted, go encourage the brethren. Our hearts need converting every day. Else we'd be the first to throw down and run. But this is a call to follow Christ. And we have many precious promises. That's the thing that I love about reading the scriptures, the good news of the gospel, the precious promises that are in Christ. Here in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, he says, Whereby are given unto us 
And who is he talking to here? If you go up into verse 1 that we read, he's talking to those that have obtained like precious faith with us. How? Through the righteousness of God. And then it says, and or even our Savior Jesus Christ. There's no other place where righteousness has ever been established and earned other than in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's because of his work imputed, attributed to those for whom he died that we have that hope of being righteous before God. A righteousness that answers God's righteousness. That's what we need. And so this is what Peter's writing of here when he talks about these exceeding great and precious promises. This is not for everybody. If you walked into a room and found a love letter on the table written from by a husband to his wife and you were a stranger and picked up that letter and started reading it and thinking, oh, well, this is what the, he thinks of me. No, it's not your letter. That's the same thing with reading the scriptures. People read it today as if it applies to them. It applies to those that God the Father has given to his son and for whom his son came into this world that remnant according to the election of grace and to them are these exceeding precious promises given and he says that the that by these verse 4 and we're going to look at some of these that Christ was teaching his disciples but by these ye might be what partakers of the divine nature there are a lot of people that have misread that or misinterpreted it to think that, oh, by the Spirit now, I become like Christ. I'm given a divine nature. No. When it says that ye might be partakers of the divine nature, who is it that had the divine nature? It's Christ. So right next to that, put a parenthesis around it, and next to it, put Christ. That ye might be partakers of Christ having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's the only way to escape the corruption of this world. We still have it in this flesh, but notice of this world. It's because Christ was pleased to come and pay the sin debt and deliver by his spirit his own out of this world. That's what our Lord is doing here with his disciples. So come back here to my text. There's really just two parts I want us to look at under this heading of precious promises. First of all, in verses 1 to 4, we have here the precious promise of the continuing work of the Holy Spirit. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ came and finished the work as far as the salvation is concerned, as far as the legal obligation that was necessary for God to be just and justify his people and that he should then rise and ascend into heaven but how is it that his work is continuing on today it's through the work of the Holy Spirit that's what he said I'll send another comforter one like unto himself another advocate his spirit and so we see the need for this. This is the precious promise to know that his spirit is in the world. That's why he says that unless he went away, the spirit would not come. He's not talking about the fact that the spirit wasn't already at work, but he's talking about the manifestation of the spirit that took place on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, when there was a pouring out of the spirit upon all flesh. And that's what the Lord told him to do, wait in Jerusalem. Until what? The promise was given. And then, once the Spirit was poured out, beginning at Jerusalem, and then into Judea and Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the world to carry this message. That's how Christ has purposed that this work be carried on. And it's been going on now for nearly 2,000 years since then. A lot of people think, well, maybe Christ will come back in my day. He might. It might be the end of time, but even Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and told them there's got to be a falling away first. Don't think that his coming is at hand. I've surprised some people in telling them, what if the Lord waited another million years? What's a million years to the Lord? It could be. I know this, that there's not going to be one missing for whom he came and paid the sin debt. So 
So if they're not born yet, then he's not coming. Because it's going to be when every one of those sheep he is drawn to himself, then he'll come again. But I, I know this, he's coming for us either way in our lifetime. You say, how so? Well, he's going to take us out of this world. And if he does, glory be his name. Imagine the beauty of being able to leave this flesh and leave this world and to see this one who paid the debt. But either way, we've got these exceeding precious promises. And that in the work of the Holy Spirit, in the face of certain opposition and persecution, Christ had already said that in John 14 and verse 18, if you go back there. See, this is all, it's taken us time to go through these chapters, but it's all linked together. In John 14, 18, just to remind you, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Well, he spoke that of his resurrection, certainly, but even after he ascended into heaven, when he says, I will come to you, he's talking about coming in his spirit. Because verse 26, we saw that in John 14, didn't we? The comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So here we find the precious promise of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage all of us, when we face opposition with family, loved ones, or even people in the world over this Christ that is so precious to us, made precious to us, let's not forget that we have the Spirit of God if we're His. And it's that Spirit that teaches us how to answer, how to respond. I know sometimes we like to think if I could just get the right thing to say, don't worry about it. Because the Spirit will direct as to what you should say. That's what he's promised. They'll put you out of the synagogues. Coming back here to John 16. Our Lord warns his disciples of that coming opposition and persecution. And therefore they should not be surprised or stumbled by it. That's what the word is there that he uses so that you should not be offended. It's actually in the Greek the word scandal. Scandalize. That you not be scandalized. When they do put you out of the synagogues. It should surprise us that we're not put out more often. As far as this world is concerned. Because that's how Christ was treated. And uh, the disciple is not above the master. But even more so. Not only the promise of the Spirit in the face of opposition, but as it says there in verse 2, even in the face of certain death. I'm thankful I don't know the half of what people have plotted against me over the years I've preached around the world. <laughs> and uh, as I said, there's certainly some that would probably be delighted when they read one day in the obituary that Ken Weimer is gone. There might be some cries going up all over the place because that's just how hateful people are with regard to this message of Christ. As the Lord has given it to me to preach, even here it says that they will think to do God service. That's an amazing thing. But our Lord is not mincing words. That word that he uses for service there is actually... A word that was used of the altar in the temple. That by killing you, they're actually thinking that you're the sacrifice that God would be pleased with in them killing you. And good riddance. I know this. We have it pretty easy in our day. And it is always helpful, I think, for us to go back and read some history. To see how... Over time, the Lord's people have been persecuted, even unto death. This was particularly true of the disciples. All of the disciples died as martyrs, except for John. He lived to an old age, but he was still in exile for a while on the Isle of Patmos. They threatened to boil him in hot oil, and the Lord delivered him. 
But other than that, all the rest, the 11, you can look it up and see where the Lord had sent them. Thomas went all the way over to India, but ultimately died a martyr. And when you read the annals of what took place, you wonder sometimes how it is that men could be so hateful to such a point, but such was the case, probably the one that we know most about or hear most about was Nero, the one that Paul suffered under and was actually decapitated under his tyranny. But when you read how he treated those of the first century and persecuted them and put them to death, it wasn't an easy life. A book I remember reading many years ago, in fact, I looked it up to try to see if I could find a copy and I found it. It's an old copy called The Martyr of the Catacombs. And if you, there's several out there, Martyrs of Catacombs, you can read them, but that one specifically was written back in the 1800s. And uh, the purpose of the author was to show just what those Christians in the first century endured for Christ's sake. That little symbol of the fish, actually in the Greek are the three letters that refer to Christ as the Son of God. Today you see it on the back of trucks and on people's walls, everybody's got a fish and I'm a Christian and all that, it's popular. But back in the day it was a symbol unknown to the persecutors of where to find others who were meeting together even under those circumstances under the threat of death in order to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know as I've ever been under such a threat. I've been arrested. I was arrested for preaching. They came and stopped the meeting and hauled me off down to the, the police station. I didn't know what was going to be next, but the Lord overruled. In fact, it was such an amazing thing because the captain at the police station his wife was one of the ones that had been in our meeting and after they had processed me and got my paperwork and told me I was not to preach to get out of town, the religious, it was the religious people of that town that had heard I was going to be there and, and they're the ones that sent the police to arrest me. But amazingly, as I was leaving, the captain of the police department came and pulled me aside and he said, I want you to take my wife to our house. He said, you can preach there. That's an amazing thing. So I did. I didn't know if I, it was a trap. I was going to get there and find out they'd come arrest me again. But the Lord tendered the captain's heart to have me go to his house and preach the message that they'd try to stop me in preaching in the school building. So all these things, but even that, I look back, that's nothing compared to what these endured, even to the point of laying down their lives. But here's the comfort. Again, the precious promise that we find here in what the Lord told them in verse 4. These things have I told you that when the time shall come, not if it come, but when it come. I can't tell you over the years as I've preached the gospel and the Lord's drawn different ones and then all of a sudden they're surprised that their family members are angry at them and upset at them, won't talk to them, won't have anything to do with them because you don't worship God like we do. Well, the Lord brings a separation. But even then, when the time shall come, not if, the scriptures say that any that will live godly are going to suffer persecution. In other words, live according to this rule of the gospel. But he says that you may remember that I told you of them. And he's not just saying that in the sense of, I told you so. But to remember, ah, this is what the Lord spoke of when he spoke to his disciples. And he says, these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. There were a lot of things the Lord did not tell his disciples, but now he's telling them why, because he's preparing them for his departure. First to go to the cross and then ultimately into heaven itself. But that's the precious promise, the promise of his presence with them. How? Through the Holy Spirit. And that's what he 
says there in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But I, if I depart, I will send him unto you. And there we see the oneness between the Father and the Son, because we read it back there in John 14. He said, The Father will send the Spirit in my name. Here he says, I will send him unto you. That's the harmony of the Godhead. What the Father has purposed, the Son has executed, and the Spirit applies. That's a beautiful picture that we have there. During the earlier part of Christ's ministry, there were many things that he told them, I cannot say unto you now because you can't receive them. You've ever wondered why the Lord just doesn't open up your heart and memory to everything concerning his glory at one time, but only discover as we go along? I dare say we couldn't take it. It would be so overwhelming to these finite souls of ours that we couldn't bear it. It would crush us. It would kill us. Thankfully, he teaches us as we go along, just like a good shepherd does his sheep. And I'm thankful that he brings his sheep along as fast as the weakest sheep. You might stop and think, why didn't he make them all strong? So they're just not, they're just all marching in lockstep. I've never seen sheep mar marching in lockstep. <laughs> Nor is it in his body. Every one of us is where we are now because of how the Lord has taught us. And I'm happy to have it that way. That's why when new people come in and others that may not be as far along, but if they're in, the Lord's brought them in. We're not like goats button different ones because they don't seem to be quite where we are. That's pretty arrogant right there to think that. No, we rejoice in every one that the Lord brings along. But that's a precious promise, the promise of his presence and the promise of his spirit. But right here that I just read for you in verse 7, because the next section here, verses 5 through 7, I see here a precious promise of Christ's finished work and his ascension into glory. When he says there in verse 5, but now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me whither goest thou. Well, we know back in John 14, Philip had already asked the Lord, well, where where are you going? Show us the Father and it sufficeth us. So what is the Lord saying here when he says, none of you asks me where I am going? Peter had asked the question earlier in John 13. If you look back there in verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? And Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now but thou shalt follow me afterwards. So when the Lord is saying here, none of you is asking me now, they're a little hesitant, especially as they're walking along and he's saying some pretty scary stuff of what to expect. They're in the freeze mode here. And yet for that, the Lord does not reject them or cast them off. Aren't, aren't you thankful I am that he doesn't cast off any one of his own. Here, I believe the Lord is simply saying, all of this is so difficult for you to apprehend that none of you now even knows how to ask, where are you going? What's ahead? They couldn't know. But he says there, and here's the reason I say that, because when you come back here to John 16 and verse 6, but because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Have you ever been so full of sorrow you can't even talk? Words don't come. The weight is so heavy. That's, that's their mindset at this point. In modern language, we'd, saw, we'd be saying, boy, this is a real downer. Everything we're hearing here. <laughs> and yet the Lord was upholding them all along, putting one foot in front of the other walking along this path, going toward the Garden of Gethsemane in the dark of the night. You 
can imagine all of these things taking place. But here then, as the faithful shepherd, having said all these things of what to expect, we see him now giving that precious promise of the necessity of his going away. I picture here a lot of times I've had to travel and when I had the kids at, at home and they found out I was having to leave and go away again, it was like, Daddy, why do you have to go away again? You know, there was a, there was, those are always tender times, but difficult times to be separated, but oh, the joy of coming back. And I foresee that this was the case here with our Lord and them thinking, why does he need to go away? This is the amazing thing even at this point with the disciples, as much as he taught them about his death and the necessity of it, they still hadn't perceived it. That's why I know salvation is not based upon our knowledge. A lot of people like to think that you got to get it just right. And I've heard these theological discussions. Well, just how much do you need to know to be saved? My answer is I know nothing. I am nothing. And that if I'm saved, it's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone on that cross that saved me. That was the salvation of those disciples. Because even right on up to his death, remember what Peter told the Lord when he told him that he would die? And Peter said, no. Put it behind you, Lord. And uh, he said, even if, I, if you go to prison or to death, I'll follow you there. And the Lord had to remind him, said, no, he would walk that path alone. And that before the cock crew or crowed, however he said, he would deny him three times. And he did with swearing a little girl around the fire. That's all it took. Peter was nothing. And yet the Lord was going to the cross for him for every one that the Father had given. I'm thankful it's not based upon knowledge or my knowing. Yes, those for, that Christ has paid their sin debt, he will draw them. He will teach them. But even now, I have to say, the more I know, the less I know. A lot of people think, well, you've been preaching for some time. You must know it all. Nope. I'm just like a little kid. Every time I come to these scriptures, prepare these messages, teach me, Lord, because... If you haven't paid my sin debt, any knowledge I have is nothing, nothing. But that's why he says here in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. See that word, it is expedient. A new way, another way of looking at that would be, it is to your advantage that you go away. When I first learned to play tennis, I found that an interesting word because if you ever try to figure out scoring in tennis, you know that after you get to a certain point and if there's a tie, then if one person wins, they put add on the end of it. That's just to let you know who has the advantage. And then if you come back the next time and that person counters, then you're back to equal again. No one has the advantage. That's the word here that our Lord is using to describe his going away. And when he talks about going away, keep in mind the first thing was his death. It is to your advantage that I go to the cross. They couldn't see it that way. And yet that's how God purposed that sin debt would be paid. And that those that the Father had given would be justified. That shows us the necessity of his death. A lot of people today want to talk about eternal justification. Well, God purposed it from eternity, so it was done. No. Our Lord is saying here, it is to your advantage that I go away, that I go to the cross. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, he didn't just disappear. He went to the cross. And then rose again and then sent it on high. He said, I'll send him unto you. So this is our Lord in the precious promise I see here of his finished work. It was necessary that he complete that work. I'll tell you this, if the disciples really had understood a 
ahead of time about what was to happen, it would be all the more difficult for them to believe. How can this be an advantage? How can the death of the Lord Jesus Christ be the advantage for those for whom he paid the debt? Well, you stop and think about what was ahead. You mean to tell me it was to their advantage that he be arrested? Because that's what about was about to happen. Do you mean to tell me it would be to his advantage that at this point then all the ministry of teaching and miracles would stop? Because up to now, these were things that were going about, but now they would stop. You mean it would be to their advantage that he be beaten? That's what was ahead for him. That he be mocked, that he suffer the kangaroo court sentence of execution and ultimately be nailed to a cross. Nothing about this seems in their minds to be an advantage. How could it be? Or that he would be numbered among transgressors and that ultimately his lifeless body be laid in a cold grave. That's why after he rose again, those two on the road to Emmaus, as they were walking along, and the Christ appeared to them and asked them what they were talking about. And they were surprised. You mean you've been here in Jerusalem? You didn't hear about what happened? And they said three days ago, well, that should have signaled something to them right there because the Lord said after three days I'll rise again. On the third day, there he was, walking with them, talking with them, but their eyes were holding, it says, until they got to their house and the Lord entered in and he broke bread. Just the way he broke bread. Their eyes were open because they'd seen him break bread before. Thank the Father, break the bread, feed the multitudes, and suddenly now, and then he disappeared out of their sight. They couldn't see the advantage. That's why I say, you say, well, were they saved? Yes. They were saved when Christ paid their sin debt. It's not how much we know or how much we retain. Thank God it's that way. What are you going to do if suddenly now your mind is taken away? And you suffer from Alzheimer's or dementia and can no longer think about Christ. Are you telling me that your salvation depends upon you holding him, knowing him? Thank God it's not that way. It's him holding me. Him having paid his sin debt. That's the advantage. But he says to them there in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. That nevertheless, <laughs> someone reminded me last week after the message, they said, I was just sitting waiting for you to talk about the but, because I like to talk about the buts of Scripture. There's this but, but God. We've got a lot of buts down through this whole portion of Scripture here. And uh, it starts all the way back there in uh, John 15. If you go back in John 15 and verse 15, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, but, there's that nevertheless, I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. That's what that nevertheless is. Thank God it's so. What makes the difference? It's the buts of God, but God. Same thing in verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But, because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. All the way down through there, we see that. And here's a but again in that verse 7. He said, but because, you see that? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, here's where we see he never leaves any of his own to themselves. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. Why has the comforter come now? Well, it's because Christ finished the work. If you look over there in Acts chapter 2, and we'll pick up on this next time, the work of the Comforter. But when he poured out his spirit on that day of Pentecost, Peter declares that this was the evidence, and this was the proof. He 
goes back in verse 36 of Acts 2. When that spirit was poured out, he says, Therefore, what was the purpose of the spirit being poured out? Let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, what, both Lord and Christ. They crucified him. They put him to death. But it was through that means that God purposed to save his people and did. That's where salvation occurred. When people ask me, when were you saved? They like to throw that word around. I was saved when Christ died. Some people say, well, I was saved when I was six years old. That's, that's too late. You know, it was when Christ laid down his life that salvation occurred. If now God by his spirit brings us to know this Christ who died, believe on him, rest in him, that's not when our salvation takes place. It took place when he died. That's why he said it's expedient, necessary, that he should go the way he did. It's to our advantage, and thank God he did. He did not halt. He did not pull back in any way. He came, set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem to pay that sin debt to the glory of the Father. This is what the Father required. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But in the shedding of blood, there is that remission of sin. That's the glorious truth. You see how those are precious promises? A lot there. I pray that's an encouragement to you. And Lord willing, we'll pick up again some of this teaching of our Lord as he continues on his way to the cross, all the while teaching his own. Well, let's sing hymn number 110. Alas, and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide, and shut his glories in when christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin but drops of grief can they repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed and look forward to the next time. Lord willing.